Welcome to the Crisis Conflict Emergency Management Podcast. I'm Kyle, and I'll be your host for today's show. And today, we're actually closing a significant chapter of our journey in 2023. As we prepare to close the year, it's time to reflect on our journey, the valuable lessons we've learned, and what lies ahead. This isn't just a recap. It's a story of our collective evolution and narrative, if you will, of how this year has profoundly reshaped our understanding of crisis and emergency management. This year, we delved into diverse yet interconnected aspects of crisis and emergency management, ranging from disaster risk reduction to mass migration, climate security, and even food and water security. We observed an evolving landscape marked by complex challenges and the effects of climate change, the intricacies of international coordination, and the crucial role of local communities and technologies. Each episode brought forth unique insights, highlighting the multifaceted nature of our field. And I would encourage you to stay to the end because we have a special announcement about what's next and what's gonna be happening in 2024 that I think you will be interested in. So as we reflect on the lessons learned in 2023 and this last year, let's take a walk down memory lane, a year where our understanding of crisis and emergency management deepened and expanded in ways that we hadn't imagined. Each step of this journey brought new insights and reshaped our perspectives. Our journey began with a pivotal shift in disaster risk reduction where we moved from focusing solely on hazards to embracing a broader view that includes vulnerability and exposures. This evolution isn't just an academic one, it's a response to the increasing frequency and severity of climate-related disasters. It's a crucial paradigm shift, intertwining sustainable development with disaster management in a world where these two are now inseparable. Point to the community level. I think that the communities, what they should do is put some pressure on their elected officials so that the understanding of disaster risk is brought to a higher level. There are very few communities that have a multi-hazard risk assessment, for example. And that's where everything starts, because in order to start taking action, you need to be sure of what are you working to change, avoid, or stall. And from there, we navigated the intricate urban landscape. We explored sustainable urban and transport planning, confronting the legacies of car-centric development. This exploration went beyond urban design and was about reimagining our lives and spaces, living spaces to be precise, to be more resilient, more adaptable in the face of future crisis. With urban populations on the rise, this challenge is becoming ever more critical. The American dream is having your own truck and being able to go, having freedom to go wherever you want, whenever you want. Moving away from that dream, even if it's not really true anymore, right? Well, Americans are stuck in traffic all the time. We lose economically so much money on it and no one wants, you know, the air pollution impacts. So the dream's not real, but it's hard to move people away from that and to make sure that we're doing it also in an equitable way. That's another big challenge is making sure we're thinking about investments and sustainability while also thinking about our equity communities that have been hurt in the past. And then we delved into systems thinking and emergency management, uncovering the interconnectedness of various systems. We learned how a failure in one area can have a domino effect impacting the entire emergency management ecosystem and architecture. This holistic approach is vital as we face complex emergencies that blur traditional boundaries. We need to look through a systems lens when it comes to emergency management. We have to get back to the basics, but the problem has to be framed. I think a lot of it comes back to training, training and exercising and education, because a lot of these things that I'm talking about are relatively new to a lot of people in the emergency management field. There's a handful of people that understand the complexity, but when you're talking about the practical application of systems thinking and being able to frame that problem on a whiteboard or walk a first responder or an emergency manager through that, A lot of these concepts are relatively new to them. So I believe education is going to be key here moving forward and being able to get this out to the masses and do some type of formalized training where we can have a baseline with guys like you getting the word out on what is this systems thinking you're talking about. It's making connections, it's making interconnections and, you know, taking that to an interdisciplinary nature, because quite frankly, I don't care what industry you're in or you do for a living. All these problems, we all have the same problems. They're all relative, they're all similar. Our conversation then took a turn into a couple of different subjects where we talked about climate-induced migration and its ties to business continuity. We observed firsthand how climate change, far from being a distant threat, 
is reshaping migration patterns and challenging socioeconomic structures. Here, the role of businesses emerged as pivotal in fostering community resilience and recovery. I wanted to concentrate on small and mid-sized businesses because they're the ones not doing business continuity and there's no reason they shouldn't be doing it. So if I can, and speaking in the broader scheme, if I can impart knowledge and empower business owners to stay in business and continue to provide their services to the community, it enhances the community. Further, it keeps their employees employed and paid. And when they get paid, they can pay for necessities plus things like pleasures in life, which are provided by other business services. So it's this wonderful cycle that keeps going. And I'm not trying to say I'm like this puppet master that has this broad impact, but at least my fingerprint is there and allowing a community as a whole to be better off and more enjoyable. We also face the realities of mass migration, especially in impact on local resources and infrastructure in border communities. This highlighted the need for dynamic, adaptable planning and emergency management, catering to ever-changing situations. It's very important to keep in mind that um, there are ideal solutions and then there are practical solutions. So it doesn't make sense to give uh, you know a recommendation to a policymaker and say, oh, implement that. No. It's very important that we think what's the global issues, what's the international issue, but then we focus on the local, we work with the communities so that our recommendations given to the policymakers are much more tailored to the, to the local communities. Because sometimes there is this tendency of thinking globally, thinking like as big as possible, but it's not really effective when it comes to climate change because the extent and the frequency that we see a certain hazard affecting community A is so different for community B. So that so yes, in terms of regulations, we can go global, we can have international organizations doing even more, but in terms of like implementation of recommendations, tailored solutions, we have to think very local. And so it's very important for those of us with you know, a knowledge on how policy making, politics, et cetera, work, that we try to frame these actionable solutions in a way that can be really useful for the policymakers in a certain area and really, you know, answer the communities because other, there's no point of doing the work we do every day. And in the digital age, managing information in crisis situations became a cornerstone of our discussions. We grappled with information overload and the spread of disinformation, underscoring the need for strategic information management as an integral part of effective crisis response. So I think we need to really be get the fundamentals right now, figure out how to clearly communicate now. And like I said, even without disinformation, communicating clearly to the public and getting your own staff not to believe the first spot report they hear and learning, you know, be tough on exercising how you confirm these things before you're going to launch uh, four trucks full of, of precious water out to a particular location or whatever it may be. You want to get used to confirming that uh, because a lot of the data there, you know, there's so many contractors coming around now everywhere selling us these platforms. Oh, we're going to look at all the, the social media and, and what and chatter. We're going to tell you what's happening so you can respond. It's like, yeah, but all of that is what's being manipulated by malign actors and just and sometimes just, just by people who are are mischievous, who just want to mess with the system. Governance and crisis management also took center stage. In a world where continuous emergencies are occurring, traditional governance models are struggling. We talked about the necessity for adaptable, enabling governance approaches, especially in politically volatile climates. Traditional governance approach is to say, well, it's the law. It's the expectation. You have to do it. And our society now is saying, no, we don't. So we have to adapt. We have to find a better ways to communicate. We have to find better ways to engage our partners, customers, our clients, whichever language you want to use there. And look at that coordination and collaboration. Stop taking a dictatorial or a directive approach and look at an enabling approach. Look at accountability and transparency. We have to be able to explain the why now. Our exploration then took us to the densely populated areas of Asia 
where climate resilience is a pressing concern. We delved into innovative solutions like heat-resistant building materials and AI-based systems, crucial in combating the unique challenges posed by climate change in these areas. So one of the challenge of like many CBDs in the world, like in Makati also, the main problem is a floating population. Most of the people, they come in the morning for the work and then they go back in the evening. So what happens nowadays is that some of the rain is starting around in the afternoon, around two, three o'clock, four, five hours. And then that becomes huge water logging in some cases. So Makati city has now, they had made some sort of agreement with the local business leader, especially the local restaurant owner, that if this type of emergency happens, they will be required to provide the meals to the people who are stranded there. Because many times they take shelter to the local schools or the city hall, whichever is safe. Disaster diplomacy was another realm we ventured into. The complex nature of leveraging disasters for diplomatic purposes brought to light the need for nuanced, long-term approaches in international relations. How do we generate trust? How do we create nice women, nice men, nice people? How do we ensure that people want to do good things? Because so many disaster diplomacy opportunities collapse due to lack of interest in having trust, not even saving lives, not even stopping a disaster from happening, avoiding a disaster, not even responding to a disaster can overcome hate. So this is the crux. How do we overcome hate? We also shone a light on the often underappreciated role of social capital in disaster resilience. Community networks, vital in recovery efforts, stood out as indispensable in today's complex world where the scale and frequency of disasters are ongoing and growing. Part of my thinking at the time was, what does it mean to be someone who's gone through a shock? What does it mean to survive? And then what will resilience look like for my family, for my neighborhood, for my community? And I began reading all the stuff I could find, everything, economic literature, agreed literature, public policy stuff on disasters. And honestly, it was pretty bad. It was pretty, it's pretty bad and in several ways. Turning our gaze to Africa, we examine the shift from a response-centric approach to more holistic, risk-informed strategies and disaster risk reduction. The challenges of implementing these policies at the local level in rapidly changing environments like Africa were particularly enlightening. We were one of the first countries to have what we call this new generation disaster risk legislation. It took us the better part of about 12 years to have a fair implementation of the act and it was promulgated in 2003. We still have major deficits in implementing the legislation in municipalities. And while you sit with that situation, it's just like, you know, it's just a talk shop. We're just saying we're doing this. We have legislation, we have policies, we have plans, but there's no real output to it. There's nothing we can see in how this affects the population or the community or how it reduces their risk or what makes them safer. An international perspective on civil planning and disaster response revealed the complexities within large organizations like NATO. The importance of early discussions and planning between the military and civilian sectors also became evident. So some of the challenges we've had is that when we do see a, a crisis that NATO wants to respond to, we don't have that time for that dialogue between what military capacities we have and options we have that could assist and the political side wants something visible and with immediate effect. And where the military is doing, you know, a really deliberate type planning and the, the political side wants quick decisions, quite often we have political decisions that are taken that don't really match with the capacity and the options the military was thinking about. So the importance of the civil military aspect is that we need those early discussions with the civilian side and understanding what the military has in their capability toolbox and understand what the political side wants to deliver, which is something, as I mentioned, visible with immediate effect. In high threat situations, we learn the value of experience and adaptability in our decision making. Insights from SWAT operations and incident command strategies enriched our understanding of tactical crisis management. 
I do not believe in U.S. ethnocentricity. I think that we need to find best practices and the models that I've developed and tested, even though they are principally based on U.S. practices, I have been able to adapt them based on culture, based on language, based on geographic region, based on territory that is around the world. And it's essential that this occurs for these models to work because critical incident management, as you're well aware, is not one-sided. And one of the significant topics we discussed was optimizing crisis management in complex global organizations. We explored the over-reliance on predefined plans and the necessity of developing capabilities, emphasizing the role of exercises and simulations. What I think matters more, you know, once we get past the duty and obligation of completing a plan, what we really need to deliver are effective capability. You have to be able to identify that there's a triggering event, something has happened, and reach consensus that that needs the level of treatment that a crisis team might respond to. That's not always easy. Sometimes crises come with a bang, but very often they don't. And those are the most challenging circumstances. And you need to have some kind of really rapid, reliable, responsible way of escalating your organization to get the right players to the table and then define a set of objectives against whatever it is that's going on. And finally, in our bonus sessions, we tackled climate security, community resilience and food and water security. These discussions highlighted the interconnectedness of these issues and the need for collaborative context specific approaches in the face of global challenges. Um, and in terms of the, the three issues that, that I think that are, are really significant and, and confronting us that, that we're learning about in some of our work, one, I think Patrick's already touched on, and that's the challenges of migration. I think there's interesting conversations taking place around climate change and whether or not that is a form of forced migration or not that, that we should continue to look into. Another is that in areas of conflict, we're seeing the, the shifting area of operations of armed groups. And somewhat related to that as a third point is the, the changing of people's identities on the ground as they embrace and drop existing grievances or new grievances that are being caused by obviously some of these challenges around climate security. I think for each one of these, obviously resilience has a, a key role to play. Again, kind of across that, that vertical axis, whether we're looking at what the, the global community is doing all the way down to how individuals are responding. I think a lot of our, our change that we're going to see taking place in the near future, fortunately or unfortunately, is going to really be taking place at the community level as they're, as they're being able to, to focus on areas of resilience, trying to, to really become their own agents of change and champions for their own causes in order to help mitigate this they're confronting uh, or even, even manage some of the challenges that, that are already hitting them. So with all of that in mind, what does the future look like? And as we look to the future, it's clear that the field of crisis and emergency management is heading towards more collaborative, technologically advanced, and community-focused approaches. The future is about resilience, adaptability, and integrated solutions that span across different sectors and disciplines. We anticipate a world where technology and traditional knowledge coexist, fostering more sustainable and inclusive strategies for managing crisis. One of the key directions for the future is the move towards more collaborative approaches. The compact, complex nature of modern crises, as we've seen in our discussions this year, demands that different sectors and disciplines work together more closely than ever before. From governments and international organizations to local communities and private entities, effective crisis management will require a synergy of efforts. But this collaboration extends beyond just sharing resources. It involves knowledge sharing, expertise, and even governance structures. Technological advancement will undoubtedly continue to play a pivotal role. However, the future is not just about adopting new technologies, it's about integrating them thoughtfully with existing practices and traditional knowledge. We foresee a world where cutting edge technologies like AI, big data, and remote sensing are used in tandem with local wisdom and traditional practices. This blend can lead to more sustainable and effective and inclusive crisis management strategies. Resilience and adaptability will continue to be solidified in our national architecture and be the watchwords for the future. Our experiences in 2023 have shown that the ability to adapt to changing situations to be resilient in the face of adversity is going to be invaluable. 
Future strategies will likely focus on building resilience both at the community and individual levels. And this involves not only strengthening physical infrastructure, but also fostering psychological resilience and social cohesion, which are equally crucial in times of crisis. And we also find that integrated solutions will become increasingly important. Crisis and emergency management will likely evolve to encompass a broader range of issues, such as climate change, urbanization, and even geopolitical tensions. This means that solutions will need to be multifaceted, addressing not just the immediate crisis, but also the underlying factors that contribute to it, moving just beyond, or moving beyond, I should say, just coordination and into active governance. So with that future in mind, I would like to introduce you to Crisis Lab. In this future landscape, the role of education and training cannot be overstated. The need for professionals who are not only skilled in crisis management techniques, but also versed in interdisciplinary approaches will be paramount. Knowledge silos should no longer exist. That's why in 2024, we will return not with just a new season of podcasts, but with a revolutionary new platform called Crisis Lab. Crisis Lab will step into the bustling field of professional development with a focus on crisis management, emergency response, business continuity, and public safety, just to name a few topics. It is poised to revolutionize the way senior professionals learn and engage with crisis management and resilience training. Imagine a hub where cutting-edge content, niche training modules, and innovative learning experiences come together to empower professionals like you. Whether you are looking to deepen your understanding or seeking to expand your skill sets, Crisis Lab will cater to a wide spectrum of learning needs by providing a new peer-to-peer learning platform designed to explore exactly the interdisciplinary approaches we've been discussing and the future requires. Gone are the days of traditional professional development. As practitioners and academics in the field, we need something more. Something that evolves, is flexible, adaptable, and provides knowledge in an interdisciplinary approach. We need a way to tackle global issues with international perspectives, to learn from our peers and gain perspective. Imagine a world where you get CEUs for listening to podcasts, and podcasts lead to new learning experiences and even in-person events, or what we call labs. We're proud to say that the first of which we are launching in Riga, Latvia in January to build community resilience in the face of growing international threats. Crisis Lab will be launching in January 2024. So go to crisislab.io and sign up for early access. Once you're on the list, you'll be the first one we contact as we open the doors. And when we do, we will provide you with a huge opportunity for savings on our NATO certified training and full access to Crisis Lab content and CEUs. Sign up today and get notified when we open. And honestly, don't miss out. The savings will be huge. So as we step into the future, it's clear in the field of crisis and emergency management that it's on the cusp of a significant evolution. Not revolution, but just an evolution. An evolution that calls for more collaborative, technologically integrated and adaptive approaches that starts to blend into the field of governance. And it will not be without challenges. It's a future that demands resilience, not just in our structures and systems, but in our very approach to managing crisis and emergencies. With the lessons of 2023 as our guide, we are poised to navigate this future build a more resilient, prepared and responsive world. We are excited for what's next, and we hope you are too. We will be back in 2024 as the Crisis Lab podcast, and we will continue to cover the trends and issues we see on a daily basis in our work, exploring the nexus between crisis, conflict, and emergency management, societal resilience, and many other themes. That's all the time we have for today's episode and last episode of the Crisis, Conflict, and Emergency Management podcast. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. We hope you have found this episode and the season overall informative and thought-provoking. We'll see you in 2024 next year as the Crisis Lab podcast. Take care and we'll see you next year.